Welcome to Growth Track. Heartland Church, in partnership with North Central Indiana Bible College, is excited to offer this discipleship program that will include, encourage, educate, and inspire you to be the person God has created you to be. Growth Track is divided into tracks and modules that dive deep into faith, answer questions you have, and connect you with Jesus. Combined with recommended readings, opportunities to grow through service, and a community of believers on the same journey, your transformation is inevitable. If you would like to become a student and earn college credit for this class, go to heartland.church and click on the Growth Track page. There you can see the requirements, application, moral code, and other information about Growth Track. If you prefer to just view this class for your own information and growth, that's great, and we hope this helps you grow. Let's get started. My name is Chris Miller. I'm the campus pastor at Plymouth Church of the Heartland. This is Knowing God's Will. This is session number four. So um, let's just pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're going to speak to us tonight, God, that you're opening our eyes to some things, that we can see things different, Lord. I pray that as we hear your word, God, that it changes us, that we, we're not the same after we have revelation about things, Lord. So I just pray that um, this next session brings revelation to some of us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, we were talking about the church and being about the body of Christ. So now I'm going to talk about knowing and doing God's will as a church. Um, much of what we've been talking about applies to churches as well as individuals. Okay, for instance, God is always at work around, He's always at work everywhere that we're at, you know, whether it's a church or individually. Um, God pursues a continuing love relationship with his church that is real and personal just like he does with individuals and these are the seven things that we we talked about like i think in session two god invites the church to become involved in his work you know he wants us to be involved in what he's doing when a church sees where god is at work that is their invitation to join him in what he's doing you know i've said when i look around and see god at work doing something i take that as a personal invitation for me that i get to be part of what god's doing God speaks by the Holy Spirit through Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church. A church will face a crisis of belief when God invites them to become involved in a work that only He can accomplish. Um, faith and action will be required, just like with an individual. A church will have to make some major adjustments in order to join God in His work. And I feel like, personally, like in the church that I'm in, that we're experiencing that now, like we've got to make adjustments to be a part of what God's doing. Um, we a long time ago stopped coming up with plans and asking God to just bless it and we started asking God what is your plan like we'll jump on to what you're doing and we realized God had a way bigger dream than what we had so it's it's pretty awesome the church is totally dependent on God for accomplishing tasks of kingdom value we can we can accomplish some things on our own but kingdom value the big things that has to be God we have to be dependent on him apart from God a church can do nothing of kingdom value so we have to have him as a church obeys God, they will come to know Him by experience as He does wonderful things through them. So it's the same things that, that we talked about for an individual. The list could go on. Something is different about the way a church comes to know God's will and the way an individual knows God, God's will. A church is the body of Christ, okay? A body functions as one unit with spiritual leaders and members, but it's one body. They're in, and we talked about this, they're interdependent on each other. Each leader and member of the body needs to, others to fully know God's will. So we need to work together and do this. We're one body. Each member has a role in the body, and each leader has a responsibility to the body to equip the members. So we're in this together. This is not like a bunch of lone rangers or a bunch of separate people that come to a building. We're the body of Christ. He wants us to fit together. And you've probably noticed, like if you've been in church for a while, that there are people who are so different than you, have gifts that are so opposite of you, different personalities, different giftings, different, just different things. Everybody's so different. And that's how we work together the best. You know, I love this, um, this example, or modern parable, if you want to call it that, uh, the parable of the train tracks. And I don't know if you've heard this, but suppose your eye could say to your body, let us walk down these train tracks. The, the way is clear, you know, there's not a train in sight. So you begin to walk down the tracks, because that's what your eye said. Then suppose your ears say to the body, I hear a whistle coming from the other direction, like I hear something. 
and your eyes argue and say, but there's nothing on the track as far as I can see. I do not see anything. Let's just keep on walking. So your body listens only to your eyes and just keeps on walking, okay? Soon your ear says, the whistle is getting louder and closer, like I hear this. Then your feet say, I can feel the rumbling motion of the train coming. We better get this body off the tracks, okay? It sounds crazy not to, like we're one body. We listen to our, we listen to our body. If our hand hurts, we listen. We just listen to our own body. But we are the body of Christ and we, ha we do not listen to each other as well. You know, this is an area we're not as united, I don't think, as Jesus would want us to be. God gave, a, gave our bodies many different senses and parts. And I think he used that illustration in the Bible for a really good reason because we can, we can relate because we have a body, okay? When each part does its job, the whole body works the way that it should. When we're all working together. In our physical bodies, we do not take votes based on majority rules and ignore conflicting senses, you know, or choose to listen only to one sense and ignore all the others. We don't do that. We listen to all of them. We listen to what we can see, what we can feel, what we can hear. We listen to all those. We don't like to take majority, like, oh, well, I'm just going to listen to my eyes today. I don't care about the rest of it. We don't do that. To live that way would be very dangerous. Like, we need all of our senses. We need all of our body working together. Because a church is the body of Christ, it functions best when spiritual leaders and members share what they sense God wants the church to be and do, when we work together and we bring our gifts in one place and we work together. A church needs to hear the whole counsel of God through its spiritual leaders and members. We all have different gifts and different things. Then it can proceed in confidence and unity to do God's will. You know, we want, he wants us to be kingdom people. So um, I'm going to talk about the kingdom and being kingdom people for a minute. You cannot be in a relationship with Jesus and not be on a mission. You know, I said that earlier. When you responded to God's invitation to be in an intimate love relationship with him, he brings you into partnership with him. You're on a mission, okay? God has added you to the local body of believers. And sometimes we even think of like our little church as the body of Christ. We're one little part of it, but we really, like God's body of Christ is every believer, like together. You know, eventually we're going to be living in eternity with him with the whole body of Christ, not just Church of the Heartland or wherever you go to church. Um, it's way bigger than that. God's ad added us to a body of believers. Together, you're the body of Christ in your community, like um, if, if this is the local body. As the head of your church, Jesus himself is guiding and working through your church to accomplish the will of his Father. Jesus is the head of our church. He's going to work through us to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. The spirit that bonds you to other believers in a local church also bonds you to all believers. So we're all part of the body of Christ. You know, I have brothers, I don't know how many churches there are in Plymouth, but there are a lot. And the ones who believe Jesus is the Son of God and the ones that believe the same things that we believe, uh, which is the truth, um, they're my brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what church they go to. God's people from every local body of Christ are part of God's kingdom. You know, Christians are kingdom people, and Christ himself is the eternal king over this kingdom. In this partnership with Christ as king, you become involved in his mission to reconcile a lost world to God. That's, that's what we're called to do. You cannot be in a relationship with Jesus and not be in a mission. John 20, 21 says, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So as soon as we have a relationship with Jesus, this isn't just like a one-sided thing or you just get to go to church and be comfortable and just do nothing for him. Like that is... Um, I think there are a lot of Christians that do that, and I think that you are missing it. Like, you're really missing out on, on what God's will is and what God's doing. So don't do that. And I don't care how long you've been serving God, how old you are. Like, none of that matters. As long as there's still breath in your body, God, there's, God's got things for you to do. God can flow through you and reach people. Um, God has a world on his heart. He's thinking about, you know, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, Jesus now functions as the head of the body, the local church, to guide it in carrying out the will of the Father. But we've got something to do. God has the world on his heart. He cares about that. You know, God established each church as the body of Christ so that he could continue his redemptive work in the world. When Christ is allowed to function as the head of the church, God can use that church, that body, to carry out his will. So when we allow Jesus to be our pastor, 
we're going to be out reaching people. We're going to be an evangelistic church because that's what he cares about. That's what his mission was. That's why he said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. He wasn't about making cozy churches and making, I mean, it's good to, don't take me wrong here, it is good to belong in a church and have a lot of friends and family at church and, and to love your church and even be a part of small groups. But if that's all you're doing, uh, that's all in, going inward. Like that is not, there's more than that. Like God's sending us out. He's sending us out, not in. So it's good. I think that churches, we should come in here. We should build relationships. We should, because we're going to need each other, okay? Uh, this isn't paradise. This is the world. We know that. So it, it's tough. So I think we need those relationships to walk through life together. But we've got a mission that's outside of this building, that's outside of our small groups, that's outside of the people that we're seeing on Sunday. There are thousands of people that live within 20 minutes of your church that don't know Jesus. Jesus can't stop thinking about them. Like sometimes we get so focused in on our little church and our little groups that we forget that there's really a dying world out there. That we're, we're walking through Walmart or we're walking through Five Star or we're walking through Bailey's, wherever you guys shop. And we're surrounded by people who, in my community, there's 40, God had me do this, um, that there's 46,000 people within 20 minutes of my church. Out of that 46,000, 15 of them, 15,000 know Jesus. Over 30,000 of them don't. That's 30,000 reasons that, that God is sending us out. Okay? So I haven't been the same. Like, since God showed me this, it has wrecked me. I can't go into Walmart without every person I look at. I think, are you part of the 30,000 who don't know him? Are you part of the 15,000? Before, I would just go through the store and not even think about it. Like, just buying my groceries or doing my thing. Now I can't stop thinking about it. Are you part of the 30,000? And if they are... Every time I go somewhere now, I'm asking God, like, what, if you want to use me, show me. Like, do you want me to buy somebody's groceries? Should I pray for someone? And I'll tell you what I am doing. Even when I don't feel like God's, the Holy Spirit's leading me to do anything, I do not go anywhere without praying for everyone I see now. Because I don't know. Are they part of the 15,000 who know him, who are going to have eternity? Are they part of the 30,000 who don't, that are that close to my church and don't know him? So I think that um, the church has a big... Big mission. Like, he's sending us out, but the first thing he wants us to do is see things the way that he does. And when Jesus is the pastor of our church, he's going to send us out. He's not going to let us get comfortable. You know, the most dangerous thing that could happen to our churches is, is that we get so comfortable that we forget that people are dying and they don't know him. Um, kind of already said all that. So, to experience God and to know and do the will of God is to put your life alongside the activity of God and let the Spirit of God show you how He can use you in your church. Okay, that's what it's all about. Adjust your life to Him and let Him work through you to draw the world to Himself. You know, isn't it sad when we become so self-centered that we come into the presence of God, we come into church and we say, Oh God, bless me, bless my family, bless my church. How sad is that? You know, when God says something like, I've been trying to do that all along, but in a completely different way than you anticipated. You know, I want you to deny yourself, pick up a cross and follow me. I'm going to lead you to places where I'm working and I'm going to include you. And there's nothing like that. Like when you start feeling like God is, and, and we're, I mean, I'm beginning to see that like over and over. I'm getting all these testimonies of things that, that are happening because God is leading our church and, and this is happening, not just with myself, but with a bunch of people. And that's way more blessed than just coming into a building and saying, God, bless my family, bless this church. Um, much more exciting to just deny ourselves, pick up a cross, follow him, find out, God, what are you doing? Let me be part of it. Wherever I see you working, I'm going to be there. I want to be part of that. And I will tell you, when you start doing that, God will start just speaking to you, and you'll have plenty of ideas on how to reach out to people. You know, you will be... What God is saying is that you'll be an instrument in my hand so I can touch the world. There's nothing like that. When I... Do that through you. You will really experience my blessings. Like that's when I really feel blessed. When I know that my life made a difference to someone. Like I, I followed Jesus. And I got involved in what he was doing. And it mattered. It mattered for eternity. That's the real blessing. Um, but kingdom ways are much different than human ways. So we're kingdom people. We're not. I'm not a Hoosier. I live in Indiana. But I don't. 
I would, I'm a kingdom person, but that, that's my real home is the kingdom. So I'm kingdom minded and I'm thinking of those things instead of human ways. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit how kingdom ways are much different than human ways. When God speaks to you through the Holy Spirit, he's going to reveal himself, his purposes and his ways. Okay. He's going to show you citizens of God's kingdom are to function and accomplish God's purposes in kingdom ways, not human ways. Because uh, we're not from, like, we don't belong here, okay? That's why he says in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. His thoughts, he doesn't think the way we do. We need to think the way he does. And he'll let us, like, he'll let us in on, on what he's thinking. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He just sees things so different than us. His ways are so much better than us. You know, the principles of God's kingdom and the principles of the world are just vastly different. They're not, no, they don't compare. The problem, if we try to follow Jesus and be a worldly Christian, we're not going to see much fruit from that. Where we really start to see blessings and fruit in our life is when we, we recognize and embrace that I'm a kingdom person now. I have a new identity. I'm a new person, and I'm going to have new kingdom ways. I'm going to do things not the worldly way that I used to do it. I'm doing it kingdom ways. So Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. And so is mine, and so is yours, you know. Your human ways will not bring forth lasting spiritual fruit. Um, God's purposes are accomplished only by God's ways. So some basic truths about the kingdom and kingdom ways. And you guys can look up, there's tons of these in the New Testament parables about the kingdom, you know. Jesus told many parables about the kingdom. And a parable is just a true-to-life story that illustrates a spiritual truth. And Jesus tried to help his disciples. He wanted them to understand what the kingdom was like. You know, that's why he would say, the kingdom is like, and then he would tell them a story, what the kingdom was like. So I'm just going to do a few of them really quick. Um, but you guys can look them up later. The parable of the, wheat and the weeds, or the tares. That's in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Using this parable, Jesus teaches that some lost and evil people are mixed with true believers. Notice, however, that God is the one who will make the final judgment about each person's relationship to him. We should give ourselves to helping true believers grow and bear fruit. God will do the weeding out, you know, of unbelievers. That's his job. When a person is not bearing fruit, we should let God work through us to help the person um, with their deepest spiritual need. Now, sometimes, however, spiritual uh, Christian discipline is required, you know, as an expression of God-like love. But the whole parable, he's saying the kingdom of God is like this. Or the parable of the mustard seed, that God can take something small and seemingly insignificant and use it to produce something large and helpful. Or the parable of the yeast is in Matthew 13. Do you ever want to see things change quickly at your church or in your community? They can, but in the kingdom, growth is more like more often like the yeast in a lump of bread dough. Yeast affects the dough nearby. Then that dough affects the dough nearest it. Before long, the little yeast can bring about change to the whole lump. Okay? Be patient and faithful to God. God will cause your small influence to have far-reaching um, effects in his timing. Uh, another one is the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. That's in Matthew 13 also. Just talks about participation in kingdom is more valuable than anything you can imagine. You know, Jesus said it would be worth giving up everything you have in order to gain interest, entrance into the kingdom. And the last one I'll share about is just the parable of the talents, which is talking about money. That's in Matthew 25. When God gives your church resources, people, or assignments to develop and use for the kingdom, he expects faithful stewardship. He expects us to use those things the way he wants us to, you know. And to those who are faithful, he'll give you even more because he sees he could trust us with that, you know. If you're faithful in a little, God will make you ruler over much. If you or your church are not faithful with what God entrusts in your care, don't be surprised if he refuses to give you any more. And don't be surprised if he takes away what you have. Um, okay, I'm not sure how much time I have, so I'll know. Okay, so um, I'm going to just share this. Two different, what is God's will? When the Bible talks about God's will, it's usually referring to one of two different things. God's sovereign will or God's prescriptive will. Um, God's sovereign will, in one sense, God's will is something that will happen no matter what. When we talk about God's sovereign will, that is something called 
God's sovereign will. When God states that something will happen, it does. Like he, no person could have stopped Jesus from dying on the cross for the sins of the world. That was God's sovereign will that that happened. You know, that was his will and it was going to come to pass no matter what. And then there's God's prescriptive will. And the other aspect of God's will is what he asked his people to do. Okay, this is often referred to as his prescriptive will. God has given many commands to his people, but he also allows us to have a choice. So we get to decide whether or not we're going to obey his commandments. He's not going to force any of us to do any of this like he just won't. Um, there are many specific instances of God's will recorded throughout the Bible. Um, there are not specific commands for every possible situation in your life, but understanding God's character through his words and specific commands enables you to seek out his will in any situation, even though it may not tell you exactly the answer to your thing, um, just by knowing his character. But when you do know God's will, you can choose to obey or disobey him. You know, but ultimately, God is still in control. Our disobedience cannot derail God's ultimate plan, but it, it, what it derails is us. <laughs> like it derails what God wants to do through us. Um, I, I think I already talked about the Holy Spirit being your guide. So I think the last thing I'll end with is these are just some personal. And this is not the whole list. I just um, want to share how to seek God's will. Nine principles, nine ways that, that I do. Um, there are many ways to seek God's will. The best thing to do is use more, one, more than one method, you know, and to look for agreement among them. So the following nine principles for seeking God's will in any situation are intended to be used together rather than individually. So don't just use one. Um, as you spend time working through your options, consider the whole picture. It can be dangerous to make a decision based on one of these principles that you feel strongly about and ignore five other ones. Okay, so um, here are the nine things. Number one, you guys won't be surprised. Um, Walk with God. If you want to know God's will and plan for your life, you must first learn to walk with Him. Okay? You need to develop a relationship with Him. Uh, Christianity is all about relationship. It's not about a religion. We just need to seek to know Him, not just know about Him. Okay? So that's number one. Number two, surrender your will to God's. You know, as you seek God's will, it's important to be sure that you're fully open to whatever God wants, okay? That you're really surrendered, you're really willing to do whatever God tells you to do. If you've actually already decided what you're going to do and you're only coming to God so he can approve your decision, you're not really seeking his will, you know? And I think I've done that before. Many times when we say we're seeking God's will, what we're really wanting to say to God is this. Okay, God, here's what I'm planning to do, you know? I'm going to need you to, like, put a stamp of approval on this. That is not how it works, you know. Before God will begin to reveal his will to you, you must be committed to do whatever he desires you to do. God will likely be uh, slow to show you his plan if he knows that you will likely not do the plan anyway. Um, you may have something in mind that you think is best for you that might happen. That's okay. Just make sure that you acknowledge that you're, that you're biased towards a certain decision, okay. But you're open if God shows you something different. Um, think through why you feel more drawn to one particular option. Don't mistake your own thoughts and desires for the, or plans as God's voice. And I know I've done that. To really understand what God is saying, be open to God guiding you in any direction. You know, when you desire to follow, when your desire to follow God outweighs your desire for a certain outcome, then you're really ready to hear from God. Um, Psalms 37.4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you your heart's desires. This verse does not mean that you will get what you want in every situation. But if your ultimate desire is a closer relationship with God, you will always get that desire when you genuinely seek His will. Okay? Don't ignore your emotions and desires when seeking God's will because He'll change our heart. God gives you emotions and desires, so listening to them is part of the process. If we're following Him, submitted to Him, He's changing even what we desire, okay? But you shouldn't let those cloud your vision as you consider different sources of guidance. Um, also learn to surrender your desire to please other people, you know? Um, the Apostle Paul says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pe uh, pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servants. That's Galatians 1.10. You know, consider how your choices will impact other people, but don't make a decision just to please someone else. And I don't know if there's any other people pleasers listening to this, but I think I'm a recovering one. I try not to be one, um, but that is an area that I can slide into because I want people to like me and I like people. 
and um, more and more probably just the older I get maybe I don't know maybe I'm getting wiser I'm getting the gray hair but um, I just want to please God like I want I care more about what God thinks about something than people and so sometimes people aren't going to be happy with my decision or what I do but um, like uh, Paul said obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of men but of God if pleasing people were the goal I would not be Christ's servant so following God is not always um, will not always make everyone happy so be willing to disappoint others in your pursuit of doing God's will Jesus was willing to die for us, you know, so shouldn't we be willing to live for him? When we surrender to him, that's when he really begins to direct our steps. So number two, um, like I said, is surrender your will to God. Number three, these are all like simple practical things that you guys probably already do, so I'm just going to shoot them out there though. Meditate on God's word. Psalms 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. The Bible can light the way as you choose your next step. You know, when you make a decision, it should line up with or at least not contradict what the Bible has, what God has said through the Bible. So as you read scripture, you will understand more about God's character. You'll be able to understand more about what he wants. Um, just as you know the things that please your close family and friends, you're going to learn to please God. Like when you spend a lot of time and you know your family, like you just know them. Uh, resist the temptation to randomly open a Bible expecting to find an answer to whatever verse you read, okay? That may work sometimes. You may get lucky and put your finger on something and it may work, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about really studying His Word. Um, you may or may find something that seems relevant, but it's not the same as really understanding God's Word and applying it and knowing what the principles are, okay? Um, when you find a relevant verse, read the other verses around it in the rest of the chapter, or even the whole book, you know, so that you really know the context of it. And um, I'm going to go through these really fast, since there's nine of them. Number four, obey what you already know to be God's will. God's pretty clear about a lot of things, so obey those things. Five, spend focused time in prayer. Um, the most obvious answer to the question, how can I know God's will for my life, is to ask him. Turn to God in prayer and ask what he wants you to do. Um, trying to decide what to leave out here. Number six, seek other people's advice. Okay, and what I'm talking about here is find mature, dedicated Christians and ask them what they think you should do. A lot of times when I see people make really crazy decisions... And they say, I didn't ask you because I knew what you would tell me. Like, if, if there's decisions like that, you, you don't want to tell your pastor, it's probably not good, okay? Um, you probably already know the answer. You just don't want to hear it. So if you don't currently have three to four godly mentors, then I would highly recommend that you seek them out right away, you know? Um, we are basically um, a composite of the five people we spend the most time with. So uh, it's important that you choose those five people very well. If you choose to surround yourself with godly advisors, they will be instrumental in helping you discern God's plan for your life. You know, the church is designed to help with this. So I would encourage you to be in church every single time the doors are open. You know, the more you involve yourself with a community of believers, the greater your chances are going to be of finding godly men and women who can help you discern God's will. Um, let's see, number seven, consider your circumstances. Uh, like I said, all of these work together like you don't just take one. God can open and close the doors of opportunity in your life. You know, you may have heard someone say, God closed the door on this opportunity, or God was opening the door to give me a job here. God often clearly demonstrates his plan for our lives by lining up circumstances in obvious ways. There was one time that I just wanted to go on this mission trip. I didn't feel led to go. Like, I, it was the first time that I thought, I haven't really heard God tell me to go, but I just wanted to go. And so I spent the money and I was going to go. And, and I'm not saying that God gave me an ear infection, but I got an ear infection so bad that I couldn't get on the plane. And so God shut that door. And instead of being crushed about it, I just knew I wasn't supposed to go. So it was all right. Sometimes, like, doors will open and sometimes they'll close. Um, over the years, I've discovered that God is pretty good at opening and closing doors. You know, he even did that for Apostle Paul. So even Paul had some doors closed to his ministry, you know. God, not circumstances, should guide your decision making, but God may use circumstances or events to point you in a, in a certain direction. 
Um, sometimes your decision is made for you. For example, when a job or college application is rejected, God has likely closed that door. On the other hand, not all, all obstacles are closed doors. That's why you need to look at all these things and not just one. Some are just things you need to overcome as you follow. I'm pretty stubborn, so even closed doors don't stop me until I really know they're closed. Um, I'll bust down a door if I can. Um, so just because a door doesn't open doesn't mean God doesn't want you to walk through it. Like It may just be... Um, you have to break through that. Uh, number eight, this is going to sound opposite of maybe something that you've heard, but listen to your heart. In addition to listening to the Spirit, I also recommend in listening to your heart. To understand my point here, consider this passage. Psalms 37, 4 and 5 say, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. I love this passage because it shows me that when I'm walking with the Lord, He will actually let me do some really cool things that I love to do. Um, when you're close to Him, He actually begins to shape your desires and change them um, to things that He's already called you to do. So then His plan actually becomes super exciting adventure, like it is the desires of your heart. I always have the most fun in my life when I'm doing God's will, like when I'm doing what He created me to do, you know. And that is because he shapes my wanter to want things that he created me to do. So um, the last one, number nine, think through your decision logically. God's spirit can direct your mind and reasoning. Sometimes Christians are so focused on hearing God that they forget to use common sense. Okay? So just as the Holy Spirit can influence your emotions, you can also, he can also influence your mind. Uh, Jesus promised that when the Holy Spirit came, he would teach us and help us remember Jesus' teaching. Um, let's see. Using reason or pros and cons list is not unspiritual. That's just using common sense. Uh, but with um, all of these things, uh, do them all together. Don't just do one. And I am definitely out of time now. So uh, it was a great class. I enjoyed sharing with you guys and just believe that God's going to continue to speak to us.